I'll tell you a funny story about something that did happen. Yeah. And I thought it I thought it was going to be a disaster, and now I have made it part of my regular repertoire. Oh, go on, tell me. So the, I'll tell you the moral of the story before I tell the story. The moral of the story is, whenever like something goes wrong and you come up with a band aid remedy, own it, own it on stage, just go for it. <laughs> yeah. And I was doing an event that I've done uh, a few times before, big black tie, big money. I mean, it's a big money black tie fundraiser. I'm there. I had a, a business meeting. It was in the Grand Hyatt. It was in the Grand Hyatt Cafe. I had a meeting. Had all my stuff with me, my tux, my shoes, everything. So then, finish my meeting, you know, around 4.30, walk across the lobby to the ballroom. I go in. We're doing rehearsal, mic checks, uh, reviewing, you know, reviewing my notes, final adjustments to the lineup, things that I got to change. Until, you know, 15 minutes of showtime. Okay, time to get dressed. And I get dressed, tucks, no problem, and I start looking for my shoes. <gasps> no shoes. <laughs> I'm like, damn, where are my shoes? So I'm running around the hotel, I'm like looking for my shoes. I'm like back on the cabin. They're like, no, we didn't find anything. No, no, nothing, nothing here. And they got, they got people looking for it. I got people looking up and down. No shoes. <laughs> I, I go on stage wearing a pair, wearing a pair of bright red vans skateboard shoes <laughs> these things are like brilliant red with white trim <laughs> and got up there and like I said this is big money and it's like they bring, they bring in the stars from Hollywood I mean one year we had Carrie Fisher Princess Leia last, this last one we had Henry Golding yeah. uh, the, the star from Crazy Rich Asians I mean I'm on stage with these types of people and I go out there in a pair of red vans with my co-star and she's, she's been on with me for she's a lovely 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 gracious and she's beautiful and elegant to the full gown she's a, a TVB <laughs> superstar Heidi Chu uh, and you know just a dream and a professional and I'm out there in a pair of bright red vans <laughs> and I got out there and I was like, all right, people, I'm bringing my lucky shoes for the fundraising tonight. Red's our lucky color. And shot, you know, and I just, you know, got out there and I was like, what am I going to do? I got out and the organizers are like, uh, damn. And I got out there and people loved it. You know, people, the shoes, that's awesome, man. They're fantastic. And I mean, half the time I go on down with, uh, you know, whether whether I'm in tuxedo or if I'm doing technology events where they like a little bit of flair, I'm where the vans have become my trademark. The brighter color, the better. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, it's so cool. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that was just like, oh, disaster. Bill got on stage with a big smile in the back of my head. I'm like, disaster. Own it, baby. Own it. So I'm thinking to myself, my goodness, who is this Mr. Andrew Work? He's some sort of international man of mystery with people organizing his work, flying to Madrid, that's amazing. I get around a little bit, you know, it's just kind of Hong Kong, right? You know, it's, uh, it's a small town, so we got to get out. All right, well, let's get down to it, all right? So, I, yeah, so MC, but the other part of my uh, show business persona, just, just to give you by way of a bit of background before you start asking the questions, is yeah. uh, so there's the MC, there is auction. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I do uh, kind of ad hoc uh, radio for RTHK, so sometimes back chat, which is a politics show, right. and I do that because I publish uh, I publish a political journal in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and then I do money talk just because I did back chat and they figure I can do it, <laughs> so they asked me to do that sometimes. Wow, that's amazing. So, there you go. That's the full. That's that's kind of on the show business side. That's it. So excellent. And uh, may I just compliment you? You've already preempted my first question, so that's very good. Well, well anticipated. Oh, okay. So <laughs> should I? Okay. So I just I just meant that for background. When when do you want to start the uh, the cameras rolling, as it were, the uh, the audio rolling? Well, what I'll do is I will I will um, go through my list of questions, and um, and after that, I when I um, next week or so, I'll, I'll make it. I'll edit out a bits and pieces and put it all together. Okay, so I, I, I'm not going to hear you do your. I'm not going to hear you do your preamble. You're not going to be like, "Hi, this is Ben, and we'd like to welcome you back to the." No, I'll add all that later. I could do that now if you wanted me to, but I, I think I'll just add it in later. All right, let's take a break for a few words from our sponsors. Hello, I am Big Ben, and I am the sponsor. Now to keep my costs down. Not every single episode is available as a downloadable podcast all the time. But they are all available on my website, thebigbenshow.com slash podcasts. So 
If there's an interview you really want to listen to, just go to my website and listen there. And if, like me, you are fascinated by all the performers, all the tips and all the resources mentioned in this podcast, and you want to learn more, then go to thebigbenshow.com slash podcasts. There you will find detailed show notes for every single episode, as well as the occasional photo and video. Alrighty, let's get back to this week's discussion. This is your show, let's do it. <laughs> Brilliant. Did you used to be a politician in Canada? Uh, yes, I was involved in politics, uh, starting with uh, student uh, council in high school, and then uh, continuing on to get involved in federal level politics while in high school, and then when I got to university, uh, continued with federal level politics, albeit at the other end of the country, but then also got involved with on-campus student politics. Wow. And how has that experience as being a campaigning politician helped you later in your career as your as an MC? Well, you got to speak to people. I mean, when you're mm. doing politics, there's a number of different roles ranging from the policy guys. They can be a little bit backroom. There's the fundraisers. They can be a little bit backroom. But if you're going to be a front man or stand for election yourself, you got to talk to the people. And sometimes they don't want to hear from you. So sometimes <laughs> you got to be really loud. <laughs> and... Okay, university. So I'm not, yeah, I'm not talking about shouting down protesters. I mean, walking into a classroom of literally 800 uh, biology students first year that are all doing their own things and having their all you know having their their own conversations before the class starts. Yeah, and uh, you've got you know two minutes to get up there and say your piece before a prof comes and kicks you out. I see. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That that makes sense. That that sort of. When you first hear about it, from politician to MC, it seems like a bit of a jump. But actually, there's a connection, isn't there? In, yeah, in the speaking to audiences. And, yeah, because I would do that without, without a microphone. Now, now at least I know I'm going to have a microphone pretty much everywhere I go, unless it, you know, unless it cuts out on me. But uh, yeah, yeah that would be 800 people just trying to get their attention and tell them what the four points of your campaign were and get out of there. What about... The change, though, from um, from being interested in, interested in politics to becoming an MC. Well, you know, when I came to Hong Kong, I pretty much gave up the politics. A stranger in a strange land. Yes. And uh, yeah, I think a lot of people get asked to do MC work on a small scale in their company or if they're volunteering with an organization. Uh, and I somehow got pulled. You know, I did it a couple of times on an ad hoc basis. My early in the late 90s when my early days in Hong Kong things like so if somebody figured out I could do it would ask me to MC a 500 person black tie charity ball so yes. it's a bit of a bit of a character you know just because I wasn't afraid of a microphone I'd do small ad hoc things like community events whether it was my alumni or mm-hmm. things with the Canadian Chamber of Commerce for example but then also later you know whenever I worked at a company and they needed somebody to MC or run an event I would quite often be called in duty yeah yeah and so you had to getting a bit of a reputation for it. Were there any big turning points or was it quite gradual? I think for me the big turning point was when I went from MC to uh, to MC and auction, when I became an auctioneer. Right. So years ago, uh, I was running the Canadian Chamber and we had our annual ball and we had a professional auctioneer come in to run our live auction part of the evening and uh, he was terrible. An absolute disaster. <laughs> <laughs> so... The next year came around, and the board looked around on the table and said, well, Andrew, you know, you're a good speaker. You can't do worse than that guy, and <laughs> you know where the money is in the room because you know the community. I said, okay, fine. I'll give it a try, whatever. I'm game, and it went pretty well, and there was a company called Fundraising, and they were doing the silent auction part of the evening, mm-hmm. and the boss of that company, uh, she said, she looked at me, and she watched me do it, and she said, you know what? You can do this, and I will pay you to do it. Oh. And so I started working with that company and uh, have since become part of the package, shall we say. Oh, wow. That's, that's, that's great. There you go. Uh, yeah. When you're being an MC, um, how do you remember, or an auctioneer, how do you remember all the names and the titles and the all, all the... all the Are you like an actor? Do you have to go and learn lines for every single event? Uh, yes, and usually, sometimes they'll provide you with an MC script, but what I 
explain to the organizers is that I will take their script and I will use it as a guideline to make sure that I hit all the important parts that they want communicated to the audience. And then I will say it in my own words. And that keeps it more natural. It keeps it more energetic. Uh, it's always awkward to put, you know, unless, unless you're an actual actor. Uh, mm. It's always more natural to put your own words out to the audience. Uh, I guess an actor gets paid to read somebody else's words and make you believe it. That's a different craft. Mm. So, so yeah, you have to memorize. I know in Hong Kong, typically, the uh, quote-unquote local style is to read off of cue cards, and I think that is just deadly. Mm. Uh, I think you're really doing a disservice to your audience if you haven't done the work to yeah. come up with original material, make sure that it comes from the heart, and then commit it to memory. Wow. And nail it. Yeah, I mean that's a lot of work because an actor, if they learn their lines, they're gonna have to say, they can say the same lines for the whole season, the whole run of the play, but you have to learn a whole new bit for every single event you host, I guess. Uh, correct, absolutely correct. Whether it's a long list of sponsors, whether it's a long list of sponsors, or yeah, uh, introducing a head table where you've got ten people that have long and complex titles in a foreign language, like let's say Russian. Gosh. I've done that before. <laughs> Do you have any? You know, first, yeah, first name, last name, each has five syllables, and then they've got a <laughs> ten-word title, and you've got to memorize ten of those in a row, and you can't get it wrong. I mean, that's a challenge. And, uh, one of the things about being an MC, yeah. you have to get the names right. Yeah. You know, there's fair, yeah. Do you have any any tips, any anything that any uh, mnemonics or any any ways of learning, or do you just is it just learn it, do the hard work? It's all about storytelling, and the thing about a good story is that it has connective tissue. Yeah. When you move from one part of the story to the next, there are things that connect them. Mm -hmm. So quite often, people will give me a script, and in their minds, they're just writing a checklist. Mm -hmm. But when you get on stage, you want to tell a story because that keep, brings people along with you. So even if, even if it's something as simple as moving from talking about the sponsors to make sure you turn off your mobile phones or now I'm going to tell you about how the silent auction works. Uh, you know, those things all have to be connected in a way that the audience comes along with you. Yeah. And so that's, that's why you write your own script. Yeah. Right. Event organizers, they don't think like that. They just think, Oh, here's a checklist of things that we have to check off uh, yeah. before main course. But, being a good MC, you got to bring the the audience along for the ride. Yeah, I'm very impressed because I, I don't often do um, the so, sort of work that you do, but occasionally I have done. I can remember once being at a trade fair um, for Samsung phones about 20 years, 15 years ago, and I had a long spiel to talk about with the phone, the special model numbers, and I could never remember all those num the numbers, the S750.276. So I, I used to just end up coughing and pretending I had a very bad cough and couldn't finish it and wait for my co-host to take over instead who could memorize things much better than me. <laughs> well, there, there, you can get a cheat, for example, if you've got uh, you know, screens on stage where they've got the 23 sponsor logos up. Um, but you really, even then, you have to make sure you know what you're doing because people think, oh, great, I can just look at the logos and, and there's that many. Sometimes some of them are so tiny, you're up there on stage and you realize you can't read what the name of the company is on this tiny little yellow smudge on the screen. <laughs> so yeah. so you, I know, guess... you, can't, you, can't, you can't depend on it. You really have to know your material. Yeah, I guess that's one of the tips then for someone who's trying to do this. You've got, you've got to put in the hard work and, and memorize all, all the stuff. Exactly, exactly. So I'm sure you get, um, I know you do, you must do, you do serious, um, uh, some serious hosting, but sometimes you'll be hosting something funnier or more or more lively maybe some sort of fight fight event or something absolutely i've what? done everything from you know major business events i just came back from doing one for the world bank ifc in uh, madrid yeah the one for them berlin and that's full that's full suit tie uh definitely high energy but uh serious events but then i've also done things where i've gone on stage in a pair of giant white pantaloons tall black boots and a Sequin vest, no shirt. You know, as a as a lion tamer uh, for, for the British yeah. Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, I, I've, so, I mean, I've seen I've seen you on on photos dressed in some sort of like furry Eskimo gear. It seemed to me like you had some sort of furry. What's the weirdest costume you've had to wear? <laughs> oh, that was I think that was years ago for the Canadian Chamber. A night at the Ice Palace, and dressed like a Cossack prince with a giant fur hat. <laughs> 
I'm it. sure it was faux fur. We didn't we didn't pay enough on the costume rental for real fur, so the animal the animal rights people can rest assured. <laughs> Serious, being serious on stage, or, or being, or being more comedic. Do you, do you have a preference, or how do you choose which way to go? Um, it's whatever the client wants, whatever yeah. the situation demands. I mm. think the one of the skills is being appropriate for the situation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, sometimes it's a very serious event. If you're doing, uh, for example, if you're doing a war memorial service, there's a different, you know, then you need to bring a gravitas to the situation. You know, yeah. that's that's a zero humor situation mm. um, at the at, you know there might possibly be the slightest opening for a wry sort of humor but usually not even that so you That's... really have to modulate for what the situation demands be able to bring it up and down uh, but... one of the challenges you get for example with black tie charity auctions is mm-hmm. that people go there to have a good time but they give money because they feel sympathy for some really horrible situations, whether it's abandoned children yeah. or animals that have been tortured under horrible circumstances. And quite often, somebody from the charity will get up on stage to explain that, and you know, they, they want to tug at your heartstrings to increase the donations, mm. right? because that's what he's there for. But you, then you've got to segue from that and bring the audience back up to having a good time without being disrespectful to the cause. And that's an art that is learned and not yeah, understood that's, by people. That's tricky. That must be very tricky. How do you do it? You really have to be able to read the audience and modulate your energy levels to match where you're going with that. Mm. And I think you also have to be very upfront about the fact that saying, you know, we're privileged. We're able to come here and have a good time. Mm. And we're here to help those who don't. So, you know, you're having a good time can help, but give, <laughs> you know, but give. Yeah. So. So just to backtrack, did you say you've, you've hosted and emceed at, at war memorials? Did, is that what you said? Small ones, wow. yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's been it's been a few years since I've done that. Normally, I'm just an attendant now, or I lay a wreath. But years ago, um, you know, been involved in small scale things like that, mm. or you know, presiding over a wake. Yeah. You know, you don't really call that MC. You don't think of that as MCing, but it's one of the same functions. You get up, you call everybody's attention, yes, and yes. introduce people to come and speak. And you know, in particular, a few years ago, it was for a friend of mine. Uh, he died at 34 years old. It was pretty oh. tragic circumstances, and of course, everybody was completely destroyed. But wow. uh, then, you know, you bring something different to that. So you do the whole range. I mean, you go from something as as tragic as that to something yeah. as wild as being the MC at like a boxing or a mixed martial arts event. Fight night. Oh yeah, I've done plenty of fight nights. They're fun. They're a lot of. They're a lot of work. Uh, really? Got to remember a lot of details, but yeah. they're a lot of fun. I've never been to a fight night. So what 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 do, what do you what do you do as an MC there? Is it hyping up the crowd? Well, once you get on stage, you just have to remember everything you have to remember while you're on stage for that that period until you step off again. So the yeah, definitely getting the hype of people. Uh, fight nights and especially charity black tie audience fight nights are, are a different kind of challenge because people are there to see the fight. They're mm. like, oh, by the way, we have a charity, so trying to get them to focus on the charity from time to time is a challenge. Right. And when you get on stage, you have to know the process. You have to know uh, what the process is that works and how the judges make decisions, how they enter those decisions into the judge. Then you have to bring it back, make you know, announce the winner. I see. In the pro- in the proper manner, and then while every then there's a bit of milling around and everybody doing their thing. In the meantime, you know, while everybody's congratulating the winner, you're already going into the mental framework of introducing the next fight, which means that you have to know weights, records. Who's mm-hmm. coming from which corner? There's a whole other set of data that you have to have already kind of locked in. So and then, how do you? Then you get off stage once the fight starts. So how do you? How did you learn this when you were first invited to host at a at a at a fight club, a fight night? How did you learn how to, how to do it? Did some? How did you? Just no one taught you. You must be self-taught, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, you kind of ask everybody around you. I mean, if you're him seeing the fight for the first time. Uh, I'm sure the referee, it's not the first time he's refereed an event, mm. and he knows what information he has to give to the MC and, and why. And so between the organizers, the referees, you know, you make sure, one, one of the things I do when I go to an event is I go around and I introduce myself to everybody in the sound booth. Yeah. I introduce myself to anybody that's going to be on stage with me, like whether it's a, a referee in a boxing ring or whether it's, uh, you know, of course a co-MC, that's an obvious one, but... Even the lighting guys, uh, anybody that's going to be controlling your microphone, uh, 
if I'm at a five-star hotel in a ballroom, which I usually am, I'll have a, I'll have a talk with the room captain that works for the hotel that's in charge of all the waiters, just to just in case anything comes up. You know, you want to make sure you know who everybody is so you can deal with whatever comes up unexpectedly. Yeah, I think that's a very good thing. I think I, I try to do that myself when I when I turn up an event. I just try to be very friendly and sociable and, and get make friends with everybody who's around the backstage, the, the sound crew, um, the waiters. So if ever I yep. need any help, I always feel like I'm in a circle of, of friends or people are gonna are gonna be help me. If there's something I need, if I need more the sound to be louder, I can I, I know the guy's name, I can ask even from on stage. Yeah. Absolutely and you might have had this experience as well that after you've done it for a few years, you start running into the same people and they remember you and they always appreciate that. That's just, right, just that's right. There's so many people dumb. That's absolutely right. Um, in Singapore, that was very much the case. That the MCs would know me very, very well and uh, and the sound crew would know me very, very well. Yeah, yeah. I find I find a lot of uh, TV personalities, they kind of come in, they're like, just give me the microphone and they do the thing and they get out and they don't deal with anybody else. And, uh, it's a different style, I guess. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I like I like your style. I think it's a very a very good way to approach it. Now, so I have always worked locally within the country that I'm based. So I was I spent twelve years doing shows in Singapore, and almost all of the shows okay. I did while I was living in Singapore were in Singapore. And now I've been in Hong Kong, and almost all the shows I do currently are in Hong Kong. But you, your market seems to be very much more international. So how did you become so amazingly international? Pretty much the clients take you with them. I mean, you do something for somebody in Hong Kong, they like what you do. Um, you know, next thing they know, they're like, we're doing an event six months over here on the other side of the world, and we want you to come along. You know, or sometimes it's been through referral. I've done Istanbul twice. That came because it was a, it was a deputy minister of finance for Turkey. Wow. Saw me at an event in Beijing that recommended me to somebody running this thing in Istanbul and they said, listen, you know, name your price and we'll fly you out. So Brilliant. That's turned into a fun relationship too. Uh, I've done that event in Istanbul twice. My wife tagged along the first time, so that was quite a little adventure. I think I've seen it on, on YouTube when I was doing my research. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, there's some of it out there. So. so so part of it is just the market you're in. Somebody likes what you're doing and they take and the client takes you with you to the next continent they're doing their, their event in. And sometimes yep. it's, it's word of mouth or some, some, you meet somebody, you make a contact and they invite you to go somewhere else. Okay. Yep, yep, absolutely. I've done, for example, the Sailor Society, which is a great organization that uh, kind of looking out for sailors mm. uh, on major shipping lines that bring us all of our daily necessities. But, you know, these guys go months and months without seeing their families, without even getting set foot on shore because the ships turn around so fast now and they get mm. all, you know, they can get into trouble with families or loneliness or, or drugs or alcohol and Sailor Society is there for them, and but they need to raise money to do what they do. So I've been doing some fundraising for them, but then you know, done work for them in uh, Geneva, Athens, Hong Kong, Singapore, anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, so things like that, you know, they take you on the Ah, oh, that's fantastic. Sounds quite exciting. But, but, again, but it must be tiring, yeah. and it must be hard as you've got a family to be away from them so long. Yeah. Well, you know, Hong Kong's an expensive city. You got to do what you can to <laughs> keep ahead of the game here. Yeah, if it pays well, yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah. If it pays well, yeah. they're going to pay for you to go overseas. Go for it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that that all works out. And, so you know, the, so the one company I work with, fundraising, uh, they they help me step into a lot of these roles, and so I'm forever indebted to them, and really enjoy working with a great outfit uh, that does uh, silent auction you with can, charities. You can, you can mention their name if you want. You can. So it's, yeah, it's fundraising. So think of it, the word fundraising, but without the D in the middle. Ah, fundraising. There you go. Yeah. How so do you great, um, great how do you market yourself? How do you get more more work? I don't, to be honest. I don't really. Uh, you know, I have a full time. I have a day job. I have a small company I own on the side, and I have you know lots going on. And so I don't really. I haven't really taken the time to market myself per se. It's pretty much entirely word of mouth. Yes. If people ask, I, I finally got organized to put together a briefing, which is basically a list of everything I've done and a uh, one page intro, mm -hmm. and put together a bit of a YouTube channel uh, that people, if they want to have a look at some video clips. But you know, that's just what do I scavenged from <laughs> when other people took video of me at their events. So I, I don't think that's unusual. I think a lot of um, people that I've interviewed, for all the big hype about 
um, having a big presence on the internet and Facebook and blah blah blah. Word of mouth is probably the best best way for people to get like me and you to get more work. You do a good performance, you do a good event, and people more people ask to, ask for you to go to more events. Exactly. You don't have to explain it to them. You're like you like it, good. Let's go. <laughs> now you mentioned uh, briefly that this isn't all all you do. So you're also the CEO of New Work Media, is that right? Yeah, so that's a little uh, just a little company I have on the side. You know, a lot of people in Hong Kong just got a little bit of little bit of this and that going on here and there. It's a city for entrepreneurs, that's for sure. So, uh, yeah, so I just keep that keep that going, and I have a couple of side projects that I do every day. So how would you, how was your? I think that's another good point. Uh, you can't always just rely on one form of um, of one source of income. So your income will come from different work, not just working on stage, what I, what a percentage comes from different parts? What I mean, sorry, that was a very bad, very yeah. bad English. What percentage of your income comes from stage work and what comes from other sources? Well, as, as I'm sure you know, stage work is very seasonal. That's right. So you'll have, you'll have some months when it makes up half or even more than half of your income and then January, February, zero. July, yes. August, zero. Yeah. June, you know, June and December are both half months, and then uh, same with you know February. If you get anything, it'll be a half month because it's Chinese New Year. But then March, April, May are you know gangbusters, and then September, October, November. Right. So I mean, when you add it up annually, um, it probably you know you're always when you're having a good month, you think like, oh, I should just quit my day job and do this full time. But then you know you go through the down months, you're like, oh right, that's why I don't do it full time. <laughs> <laughs> But if, if you're on call and you have other work, how can you how can you find the time to go overseas? Can you you have to find work that you can easily take leave of absence from, I guess? Well, easily. I mean, you know, you just, just kind of work it out. You end up using a lot of your so-called holiday days to work. I mean, right. I probably worn a suit and tie all day or a tuxedo on, on days when I was theoretically on holiday. Right, um, right. You know, more than, you know, most people, they probably actually take holidays. Mm -hmm. you Whereas know, if I take a probably... Half my more than half my holidays from my day job are working. Mm. Um, but when you've got a day job, you know you want to take care of your own clients, and uh, you know, so you know, especially it gets, it gets quite personal. So you don't want to miss helping somebody out with their big event. Um, you know, if they're if they're relying on you to a certain extent, so yeah, it's fine. Mm. Uh, MC, you're an auction, yep. you're, an, you're an auctioneer. Are you uh, a moderator, yes, a debater? Do you have a favorite type of work on stage? Um, it's a good question. I mean, some of the, like, when I think about the highlights, like my all-time best on stage, uh, one of them was, uh, I'm also the co-founder of an economic think tank in Hong Kong called the Lion Rock Institute. The and Lion Rock I, Institute. Yeah, I did that for full-time full time for two years when it was getting going and then handed off to other people. And I still sit on the board. I normally end see those events and... You know, one year we had a Nobel Prize winner in economics, uh, mm. Vernon Smith, mm. come over, and part of that night I sat down and he and I did a one-on-one. -on -one I've seen that on YouTube, half. yes. Yeah, so, I mean, for me that was a real highlight uh, because, you know, entertaining is great, but for me that was something a little more substantial. You know, people sometimes forget that you actually know some stuff. <laughs> and so being able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Nobel Prize winning economist, for me that was a real big moment. Uh, it's unfortunately, I don't do it all the time, but I mean, you know, that means it's special. Yes, I mean, when I watched that on YouTube, I thought, hey, you could be you could be a guy on television, sitting down interviewing all kinds of people. It's um. Well, I do sub in for I do, I do radio for RTHK from time to time. I'll do back chat on right. an ad hoc basis. For three years, I was an every Thursday guy, but now I do it on an ad hoc basis, and I've done money talk a couple of times in the past few years. So. Yeah. So a little bit of radio, but. Um, you know, any like anything I do for the Canadian community is close to my heart. So whether it's you know, emceeing the Canadian Chamber Balls, I think are always fun. Uh, well, you know, I, I don't do weddings anymore because most of my friends are all grown up and married. <laughs> but you know, there was a period when we were all getting married, and it's, you know, the go-to guys for MC because you know your friends, you know. But I mean, yeah. sometimes the free stuff is the stuff that's closest to your heart. My my university alumni. Yeah. But even a lot of the ones where I get paid to do it, these are really good causes. Whether it's you know, I just did Animals Asia last Saturday. I mean, they're doing great work, at, you know, rescuing moon bears from being trapped in cages with their gallbladders tapped for wacky medicines. I mean, it's just, yeah. you know, the, the, what they do is uh, far 
religious man, I'd say this is God's work. I mean, or, you know, the juvenile, di- the, you know, the Youth Diabetes Association, they do great work. And so, you know, you, you feel good about helping these organizations when, when you can. Sure. With so many, um, so many conferences, possible conferences, so many possible topics, do you specialize in any particular area? You said you could talk to the Nobel Prize uh, winner, so that's something you actually know about, the, the topics yeah, you're talking about. Um, I can, I can do general business. I've been asked by a couple of times by me, but in the real estate, and I wouldn't say real estate's a big specialty for me, but I've had enough contact with it, you know, especially in Hong Kong, right? That's all you hear about. Um, hmm. But if they ask me to moderate a panel, you know, you do your research and you show up loaded for bear. You show up ready to go. You prepare your panel ahead of time. You communicate with all the speakers. You have a joint conversation about what you're going to talk about. See, it makes a big difference when you're moderating, for example, business panels uh, to make sure that everybody's prepped and ready. And, you know, you don't want it to be rehearsed, but everybody knows what topics are going to cover major issues so that it comes off, you know, natural. And, you know, and, and you uncover things that you didn't think you were going to uncover. So, Everyone's prepared, but not rehearsed. Because if you know rehearsing for something that's just a, it just would seem silly, and B, it would be really stiff, and you probably wouldn't get anything interesting out of it. Do you ever have any? And do you ever have any inquiries that you turn down because it's just something you don't know anything at all about, and you you even you think that even if you tried to research, you wouldn't know enough to be able to host or or organize a, a debate. Rarely, I'm a you know I, I'm a kind of read the Economist cover to cover every weekend kind of guy. So you tend to be broad, if if not deep in everything, you're broad enough in everything that you can That's handle amazing. most of the topics. You know, I got a, I've got an MBA. I mean, between that and the Economist, you know, you can handle most anything. I haven't been approached by anybody in something so technical. I mean, my my day job is in fintech and blockchain and crypto and health tech, so I've gotten up to speed on all those. And so I have another specialty there. Mm. Uh, or a series of specialties, if you will, but no, I can't think I've turned something down because I was like, nah, I oh. just don't know this topic. Oh, that's great. How about um, yeah. how about cultures? You deal with a lot of cultures. You've mentioned um, Turkey, and you've mentioned all the other countries you, you've worked in. So, um, do here's, you have to... Here's, here's, here's one. Yeah. If you make the OK sign, what, what you and I would call the OK sign, you know, your index finger and thumb yes. together in a circle, and the other finger standing up. Yeah. In Greece, that's like calling somebody an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, don't do this on stage. I got specific instructions on it. Don't be like, OK, everybody, because all the Greeks are going to be like, oh, so bad. Yeah, I can remember people saying, don't pat Malay people on the head. But I always do used to pat them on the head. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, because you work with kids, of course. Yeah, yeah don't pat but, the kid on. Don't pat if the kid's from Malaysia. Don't pat him on the head. Uh, yeah, I mean, for this for this part of the world that you and I work in, um, one thing that's a challenge is when you know you've got an audience that is mostly English second language, which is quite normal. Don't speak at your normal speed. I can speak at you know I speak very quickly, especially me when I do the auction. But sometimes you you have to find a way to slow it down, but still keep it high energy. Most people, they think fast is high energy and slow is low energy, but there's a way to do slow, measured, very carefully enunciated speech that can still be high energy. That's so, a very good point because you're going yeah. to be taking, yes, you will be, um, your audience will often be, English won't be their first language, so you've got to definitely bear that in mind and you've got to, it's no good saying something fantastic if you're saying it too fast and they, they can't hear it. Yeah. Yeah, you, you tamp down the slang, you tamp down the wordplay, you tamp down the innuendo that would require you to be a native speaker. I, I speak French as a second language, but it's not perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, so I always appreciate it when somebody talks a little bit slower, you know, and if there's not too much crazy slang in there. It just makes it easier for me to follow along and, you know, enjoy the humor if it's humorous. Yeah, these are great um, tips, so I yeah. Apply that for them. Yeah. Talking about how you have to change the way you speak depending on, on the audience, do you um, do you ever have to ever have to improvise on stage? All the time. That's that's what being an MC is all about. If, of course. If it wasn't. That's I think I said at the top of this interview that I detest cue cards, and every time I see an MC get on stage in Hong Kong and they're they're doing you know it happens all the time here. They're reading off the cue cards. It's just deadly. No, uh, I agree. In, if you can make the effort to learn it and memorize it and then say it in your own way, that's much better, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that 
the thing about improv is, is I think for most people it's dangerous because they, how do I put this? Improv can happen within boundaries. Mm. And if you're a professional, you know what your boundaries are and you work with them. So for example, when I'm on stage, uh, for presenting at a black tie event, you just never swear, for example. Yes. You know, I might curse, sway, curse like a sailor in my private life, but you just, when you're on stage, you just don't. Um, you know, because that's, that's just not how it's done. Talking about so your you, stage presence, um, yeah. are, are you a guy who likes to walk around the stage or do you like just to plant yourself and, and stay almost like a rock, a statue? No, no, no. I like running around. If I can step off the stage onto the floor, I'm not one of these guys that rolls the floor the whole time. I know people that do that, but mm. uh, that's not my style. But I do like to move around the stage. I like to make all parts of the audience feel like I got close to them. Mm. So yeah, definitely a moving around guy. If I can get, you know, I'll choose a, I'll choose a handheld, wire, you know, I'll choose a wireless over a stand mic. I will choose mm -hmm. a headset over a handheld. The more freedom, the better. So the more freedom, the better. Hand definitely hands free. And if it can be a headset, even better. Than being a hand. The headset's best. You know, if you get a lapel, sometimes it restricts how much you can move your head around because the mic, depending on where the lapel is placed, it'll mm. lose you when you turn your head too far to the left or right. Yeah, sure, sure. I understand. I'm seeing more people in the business now use uh, double lapel mics so they'll have one on the left and one on the right. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Might work. Yeah, that way you don't have to worry about it dropping to one side. Mm. Um, how about the lighting? Are you uh, are you like a stage actor? Are you always aware if the lighting is, isn't on you to get back in the light? Do you keep an eye on that? Yeah, you have to make sure that you're on the light. Uh, when you're doing auction in particular, you have to really, before you get on stage at the beginning of the night, before anybody's in the room, you have to really get up close and personal with the lighting guys to make sure, to, to find out what the lighting conditions are going to be during the auction because usually you'll change it from the normal lighting the evening to the auction lighting so you can see what's going on. You know, you have to have spotters in the audience who are helping you see. Of course, but if you're completely, yes. If you're, com if you're completely blinded, which sometimes you are on stage, um, you know, you, you can't do your job. And so you really have to explain to them and what's going on. And usually they don't know. So you have to explain to them, here's why I need you to raise the lighting in the room, turn down the spotlights, right? Even if I have spotters. Oh, that's know, I fascinating. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, because normally when, you, when, you're, doing, when you're on stage, You'd like the audience to be in darkness and all the light to be on, on, on you on, in, on stage. But if you're doing an auction, that, that really wouldn't work at all, would it? Exactly, exactly. And there's, you know, there's reasons for that. I mean, because I do entertainment auction, which is different from a Christie's or a Soth Sotheby's. Sorry, can you say right. that again? You do entertainment. I do, yeah, I do entertainment auction as opposed to professional Christie's, Sotheby's. I got it, yes, got it, got it, yes. So if I have five people bidding in a room of 500, I have to entertain the other 495. Sure, 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 sure. Which means I have to be able to see them. Yes. If I see a group that's starting to gather and, you know, a little standing up in a little group and they're blocking my view of bidders, I have to be able to see them and be able to call them out. Yes, yes. You know, and I'll, I'll start talking to them and they're not paying attention, but people around them will start poking them and I need them to sit down and be quiet. <laughs> but I do, you have to do it in a fun and playful way. Sure, if I see you blocking my bidder, I'm going to consider you a bid. <laughs> somebody pokes them and usually they're like oh my god no I'm not buying it but they run back to their seats you know have you ever considered doing stand-up comedy you sound like you did a bit I have I did uh, Jamie Gong ah. you know pretty much single-handedly invented the comedy as I'm sure you know I don't have to tell you about yeah, yeah. Jamie but I know Jamie Gong very well I've interviewed him on this podcast yeah fantastic single-handedly invented stand-up comedy in Hong Kong I mean um, and I went and did his afternoon training course and what I came out of that with was this real sense of respect for stand-up comedy people and what they do because it is so much more work than what I do. Yes, stand-up comedy is, is very difficult because it's one thing to go on stage and um, introduce something and make a few, a few fun, slightly funny comments in the right, when the mood is right, but it's an another thing entirely to go on stage and to be expected to be totally hilarious every single second for however long you're on. That's very hard. Yeah, Comed stand six, comedians. Six, every six seconds, right? That's the metric. If I that's remember right. right. Something. Yeah, every six seconds at least get to get a laugh. <laughs> very yeah, difficult. I mean that's a, that's a huge huge thing and to go out and, and come up with you know new material and then practice and fail and practice and fail and practice and fail in front of audiences until you fine tune it and nail it. I mean, you know, with an MC event, I get one shot and. 
that's fine. And if there are little mistakes along the way, it's not a big tragedy. Mm. Well, usually the audience doesn't know, just, you know, maybe the organizers. And then you get a chance to correct it when you go back out. Uh, and, I mean, in all those respects, it's very different. The other thing that's different about emceeing versus stand-up comedy is that with stand-up comedy, especially, you know, in the modern era, it's shock, 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 shock. Mm. And we... And when you're emceeing, you can't shock your audience. You are not there to shock them. You are there to make them feel good about why they're there. You're there to make them feel important. You're there to make sure they have a good time. You're not there to insult them. You're yes. not there to challenge them. Yes. And in stand-up comedy, I, I, I'm guessing you'd agree that there's a you know there's shock and challenge, and that's part of what makes people laugh. You know, being a little bit uncomfortable with the topic material. Sure. MC, no way. How do you deal with a very cold audience when maybe there's Maybe they're all eating, or they're not, or for some reason they're not, they're not listening, or not paying attention. What do you do to warm up um, a, a difficult audience? Yeah, there's two different versions of that. There's the one where they are paying attention, usually because it's the beginning of the night, and for whatever reason, the audience is not responding. And yes. you work out a range of techniques to engage them and kind of get the response, and. You, you know, the one thing you can call people out and it's like, really, are you guys ready for this? You know, they're like, nah, nah, nah. like <laughs> really, people, come on. And, you know, usually they'll, they'll appreciate that you're working for them and they'll come on board. Um, I have developed, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about filing patents for my shushing techniques, which I've, I've gotten a bit of a reputation for. <laughs> the circles of people that, you know, look for people like me. So I, don't, I can't give them all away, but let's just say that uh, my six years as a scout leader, I learned how to shush very effectively and I'm able to bring some of that from scouting onto the stage and it works really well. <laughs> so you can get people to be quiet and pay attention in, in, a, in a good way without, without yeah. offending them. And I think one of the, one of the other things that uh, you learn that kind of gives you the, the strength to carry on like, like it's a big tragedy, no, um, is that if you have an audience where you think it seems like you know people are talking the audience is just thunderous and the noise they're making and you think nobody's paying attention, why am I even here? What I found over the years is that people come up to you later and they're like, oh, wow, that was really great, or I love what you said this. And you're like, really? Somebody was paying attention? And so now I know it looks like people are paying attention. But usually, you know, even when you think you've got none of the audience, you probably still have 50 to 60% of the audience that are yeah. listening. And, and it, doesn't, it doesn't take a lot of people to make a lot of noise in the audience, but you get there. I mean, but you have to know when, it's a little bit like fishing, you have to know when to let them run, you have to know when to bring them in. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, sometimes if there's a cold audience, I might just pick on. I might not, not pick on. I might I'm, I might look at someone who is definitely enjoying it, and that and I can see at least one person who is having a great time, and it gives you the confidence that yeah, if you can see that person, maybe there's someone further at the back who's also having a great time, and maybe the the show isn't going as badly as you thought. And you're right. Sometimes you do what you thought was a bad show, and then you come off stage and people say, "Yeah, it was great. We really enjoyed it." And you go, "Okay, good." <laughs> That's very true, you know, and some, sometimes it's things like, um, you know, like, okay, if you're up there and you've been asked to, like, you know, for whatever reason the organizer thinks that you have to tell people what the bathrooms are a third time, that rarely happens, but it does. <laughs> you're like, all right, if you insist, fine, like, I'm sure people can find their way to the bathrooms, but whatever, and the audience is, like, not paying attention, fair enough, I'm going to let them run. But if you have the chairman of the organization coming up to tell you about the children with cancer just before you make a major appeal for funds, you need to be firm with that audience and you know, bring them in line and make sure you've got 99% listening and paying sure. attention. I think a lot of what you do, I imagine, requires on you appearing comfortable and confident on stage. Would you agree that you have to be at ease on stage to, in order to do your job? Yeah, people ask me how, you know, can you teach me or can you coach or... And, I, that's the one thing that I don't really know how to convince people. People have told me that I have that, and I don't really know where it comes from or how it works. So I can't teach other people. I just know I'm comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. How do I make myself more comfortable? I don't know. Um, you know, I never, you know, people are like, oh, you know, you got a glass of wine for you going stage. I'm like, no. How about never, this? Are there any situations never. where you where you are, are there any situations where you are uncomfortable on stage? Or is there anything that you're not at ease doing? Um, no, I would really, no, I don't think so. Because, you know, one of the things I've never been asked to go up and like 
sell something that was complete nonsense. Uh, uh, fortunately, I've always worked with really great people that have never asked me to do something that's completely out of out of line. So, so no, I don't. No, no I'm pretty good. You know. Right. Oh yeah, actually, wait a second. What am I talking about? Yes, I'll tell you what. There, there's. I don't know if you get this, but like that kind of free zone of excitement before you go on. Yeah. It's not exactly. It's not exactly being nervous or anxious, but there's always this energy that comes in you. It doesn't matter. Like even even when I'm sick and I'm taking like Neo Citrin, you know. But it all goes away just before you get on stage. Yes. And you get this, this little bit of excitement. You know, you're never bored going on stage. Yes. But but the the only times I feel really anxious is when I'm not prepared. Right. And I do. You know, and I think a lot of organizers they underestimate how much work a real MC does before they get on stage. They're like, oh yeah, you're an MC. You're, you're good at winging it. That's why we hired you. Like, no, mm-hmm. it looks like I'm winging it. It looks like I'm, it's just spouting out of, because I rehearsed. <laughs> yeah. I like, I know you do the kind of work where you pull things off that people are like, oh my God, how did he do that? It's obvious that you rehearsed and but people think, oh, he's MC. He looks so comfortable. He must just get up there and pull it out of his wazoo. Yeah. No, it looks like that because I rehearsed it. If they, change 20 details you know just as you're stepping on the stage like oh here's five things that are different by the way uh yeah i hope you don't forget any of that and you're like what <laughs> <laughs> that i get anxious about when yeah. i'm not prepared yeah I you think know normally because somebody's changed a bunch of details just before i go on stage yeah there's two great things you said there i mean the first thing is yeah there is there is that moment before you go on stage when you're excited and that excitement is actually very close to being nervous but it's a kind of a good nervousness and then there's the second thing is in order to not to be uh, completely nervous on stage, the more preparation you do, the better. If you're very, very prepared, then you don't need to be nervous. Yeah, and I don't like to prepare too far in advance because with these, you know, with these events, there's always details changing right up until the last two or three days before. But but if I've got nothing from the organizer three days before, then then the panic starts to kick in, and then I start <laughs> hassling, like, "Hey guys, come on, you know, finalize your rundown." Get me the speaker through bios for so I can you know craft a proper introduction. I mean, yeah. Come on, guys. Still, sometimes you get something at four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. You're supposed to show up at five. You know, you, you just step out of the shower wearing a towel, and all of a sudden you look at your computer and you're like, "What? I can't." <laughs> but you always make it. Brilliant. Oh, yeah. pretty good. Thank you very much, Andrew, for talking to me. No, oh, my pleasure. Um, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean. You know, like that movie Ratatouille where they've got the chef and he's like, if, you know, anybody can cook. I mean, anybody can MC, but for the people, I, I would say if people are thinking about doing it themselves, practice. Don't think that you can't do it because other people look natural. Those people probably practice and that's why they look natural. So if you do the work, you can do the job. Yeah. So I, a little bit of encouragement to would-be MCs or, or temporary one-time, you know, guys, people doing a wedding or a company function. Brilliant. Excellent. Yeah. Well, and thanks for having me on the show, Ben. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think it's a great thing you're doing in, in bringing the work of entertainers. You know, we, we bring light to people's lives, and hopefully people appreciate that. And maybe even if some event organizers listen to your show, they'll be able to uh, help their entertainers perform better when they're on, stra- on stage. So I think you're doing a great thing. Thanks for having me on. Sure. And before we go, there's three final bits and pieces to do. If people do sure. want to contact you, you get mainly get contacted through word of mouth, but if people want to, to reach out to you, what's the best way to contact you? Uh, let's see. So I have two LinkedIn profiles. One is just Andrew Work, which is my day job and all my day jobs, you know, as far back as I go. But I do have a lesser known uh, LinkedIn profile that I cultivate carefully. Uh, the, the day job one, I have over 14,000 contacts, but the MC one is different. So it's MC Andrew Work. Just go to LinkedIn, look for MC Andrew Work, and it'll list of all my projects. Uh, people can contact me there, and if I know if it comes through that, then I know it's about MCing or auction. Brilliant. Excellent. This was Meet the Entertainers, and I am Big Ben. Each episode takes a surprisingly large number of hours to prepare, record, and edit, and check, and re edit and re-record and edit again and throw in the bin and mend my computer and take it out of the bin and redo it from scratch and then post it again. So, if you're getting something out of this series, here are three things you can do. Number one, you can financially support this podcast by going to www.thebigbenshow.com slash podcasts and making a financial donation of any amount you like. Number two, Subscribe 
or share these podcasts or give me a good review on iTunes. And thirdly, get in touch. I'm always looking for more people to interview. My email is ben at thebigbenshow.com. Many thanks. Talk to you again soon.